All right. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you, Ben. It is a uh, wonderful time worshiping, I think, in these evenings. I've just really, really been blessed by these times together as we sing and, and worship together. So as we've been doing, let's start by hearing again the words of the Great Commission. Again, I just want you to listen. Just try to put yourself in the sandals of the early disciples on that mountain in Galilee. Be receptive instead of analytical. You'll probably get plenty of analysis just listening to me. But for now, just be open to what God has for you. So here we go. But the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had arranged with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshipped him. But some of them were doubtful. But Jesus approached them and said, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. So go and lead people in every nation to become my followers by baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and by teaching them to follow everything I have commanded to you. And know for certain, I am always going to be with you, even until the end of time. So over the past couple of days, looking at the Great Commission, we've learned that the mission is dependent on the authority of the one who has given it. We go out in the name of Jesus to do his work. If the CEO of a company tells an employee to represent the company, its purposes, its values, and its goals to a client, then the employee does it with the assurance that he or she not only has the right, but the responsibility to represent that company well. If a nation's leader sends an emissary to another country to negotiate an agreement, when that emissary speaks, it's as if the president himself has spoken. How much more must we understand that when the Lord of heaven and earth sends us out, it's important to recognize his authority and power as well as the responsibility that has been laid upon us. And then yesterday... We looked at what it means to make disciples, how it's so much more than getting someone to make a brief statement of faith. It's a life journey of commitment and dedication and participation in the mission. When we make disciples, we invite people to join us on a path that we're still learning to navigate ourselves. And today, we come to the subject of baptism. Now, I have to say... Speaking about baptism at a Christian church conference is like pushing tofu at a vegan convention. More than anything else, people in the Stone Campbell movement have developed a reputation for insisting on believers' baptism by immersion and observing the Lord's Supper every week. And that can be good. I think that's great. But sometimes it can be not so good because baptism and the Lord's Supper are wonderful gifts that God has given his church but just like the kid who gets a baseball bat for his birthday, the gift loses some of its beauty if it's used to beat other people into submission. If we're not known for something more than our sacraments, then shame on us. But having said that, you may have noticed in my translation of the Great Commission that it says, go and lead people to become my followers by baptizing them. Did you catch the by baptizing them there? That word baptize is what we call an instrumental participle. We talked about aorist participles yesterday. This is an instrumental participle. It is a means by which we make disciples. Now, close to 20 years ago, when we were in Papua New Guinea, our boys went to a mission-run international school for junior high and high school. Now, this didn't belong to our mission, this school, but most of the kids from our mission ended up going there. And during school breaks, either our boys would come out to our village or we would spend some time up at the mission station to relax and to be with them. And Linda and I even helped for a year running one of the boarding homes for the school kids. It was during this time that my younger son came to me and said that he wanted to be baptized and he asked if I would do it. And so it happened that another one of the kids at the mission station also decided that he wanted to be baptized and he asked his dad to do it. So we made arrangements and we let a bunch of people know. And the next Sunday afternoon, 
a group of about 40 people gathered at the river to support the decisions of these two young men. And we let the other people go first. The father was actually the youth minister for the mission station, and he decided before immersing his son that he would give a brief homily on the meaning of baptism so that his son and the others who were present would have a good sense of what was going on. And so he said, baptism is a symbol, nothing more. It's a way of showing others that you believe in Jesus, but baptism doesn't really do anything. Faith does the work. This is just a public confession of faith. It's not really necessary, but it gives someone a good moment to look back on. He said, it's important that you not make too much of this. My son has believed in Jesus for a while now. He was already saved. This is just a way for us all to celebrate that fact. Now, that's a quick summary. His homily lasted about 10 minutes, and I'm not sure what motivated it. Perhaps he was aware of our church background and wanted to head off any thought on my part of pushing an agenda that too closely linked baptism with salvation. But you know, I think it had to be pretty disheartening for his son to have this, made this wonderful decision only to listen to the person who was going to put him into the water tell everyone that it didn't really mean anything. It was just a symbolic gesture. Now, needless to say, I did not bother preaching a sermon. I just put my arm around Ryan's shoulders. We walked waist deep into the freezing water and I asked Ryan if he believed that Jesus was the Son of God and did he acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, and with his teeth chattering, he said yes. And I said, on the basis of that confession, I am baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as I put him down in the water, I said, buried with him in death. And as I brought him up, I said, and raised to walk in newness of life. And we celebrated. There are times for preaching, and there are times for doing. That was a time for doing, and the actions did their own preaching. Now, let me say that I don't think any of us that have been baptized fully understood everything that baptism means at the time we were baptized. Or even if we fully understand, uh, I, I don't think we even fully understand it now. You might even say that this journey we are on as Christ's disciples is one of discovering every day anew what that baptism meant. And I don't want to be too hard on this youth minister. There was obviously uh, an unspoken subtext behind that homily. I had the impression that he had had some unpleasant encounters with people who wanted to make baptism some kind of a law, a minimum requirement for salvation, as if the only point to putting someone in the water was to so thoroughly soak them that they would be forever safe from the fires of hell. And I don't want to take issue really with his contention that baptism is a symbol, but I just don't think he understood very well what a symbol is and what a symbol can do. So let's spend a little time thinking in fresh ways about this act, its meaning, its significance, its beauty, and how it relates to the mission of God. As many of you know, I'm fascinated with words. I don't have a fascination with words because I've been a Bible translator. I became a Bible translator partly because of how fascinated I am with words. And one thing that I've come to realize is how to save time and effort and mental processing concepts, we use verbs or abstract nouns as shortcuts to speak of complex events. But in doing so, we avoid having to actually think about the actual complexity of the event. So let me give you a very mundane example. Let's say I told you to go start your car. So you go out, you stick your key in, or you, with some cars, you just push the button, and the car starts. That's the end of discussion, right? But what actually happens goes way beyond the understanding of most of us non-mechanics. When you turn that key, it opened an electrical pathway from the battery to your starter motor that caused the engine to turn over, which flooded some chambers with gas vapor and sent electricity to the coil, which built up a voltage and sent it to some spark plugs that ignited the vapor and forced things to get moving. And at the same time, coolant and oil began circulating through the engine plumbing to lubricate the engine and control its temperature. And an alternator began sending power to the 12 volt battery to keep it charged Electrical power began flowing to your instruments as well as your lights, radio, and power windows. 
Different systems to assist in steering and braking came online. An integrated circuit began checking all these systems to make sure that there were no faults. All of these processes, and likely several that I haven't mentioned, have become encapsulated in a phrase, start the car. We don't think of all that happening. We just know that once started, the car is capable of transporting us to a different location. Or, and this is probably a more parallel uh, subject to the topic of baptism. Think about what we mean when we say that a child was born. Perhaps you get an email saying that some good friends of yours just had a baby girl. But if starting a car is a complex thing, just think about how much more a birth of a child is a complex thing. There's so much more to this story than just leaving the mother's womb. When a baby is born, we have the physiological dimension. For the first time, the baby's lungs suck in air and begin that interchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. For the first time, the baby's eyes will be able to see light and colors and faces. For the first time, a child's liver and kidney will do their own filtering instead of relying on the mother's body to do it for them. For the first time, a baby's digestive tract will activate in new ways and allow the child to take in nourishment. For the first time, a child's immune system will start to respond on its own to threats. But there's more going on than physiological changes. The newborn baby is instantly a part of a larger social context, a family, an extended family, a group of friends. Life for everybody changes once there's a baby. The child will hear things clearly for the first time. He or she will feel things, touches, pain, the movement of air as they interact with the world around them. The senses are flooded with new information. There are the beginnings of emotions. There is bonding. The number of changes that happen to a person at birth is staggering and multifaceted. And we subsume all of that into the phrase, a child was born. And yes, we have to do that. If we had to mention all of that every time we wanted to talk about birth, we'd never be able to hold a conversation about where on earth these people are going to find childcare when the mother goes back to work, right? So mental linguistic shortcuts are a necessity, but they can also prevent us from thinking about the multiple dimensions of events. And this is definitely the case with baptism. Now, probably almost everyone here knows that we get that word directly from the Greek. It's a translation of the word baptizo, which in the ancient Greek world literally meant to dip or immerse into liquid. But most of language goes beyond the literal. The vast majority of what we mean when we speak comes through figures and connotations. Anyone who's tried to understand poetry simply by using a dictionary knows how fruitless that can be. And make no mistake, our New Testament writers often express themselves like poets. We all do that. The thing is, there must be more to this idea of baptism than simply going underwater. We don't find the church celebrating every time somebody jumps off of a diving board. Getting totally wet is only part of the picture here. But just like being born, there are multiple interconnected dimensions at work when a person is baptized. So sit back for a few minutes while we immerse ourselves in what the New Testament has to say about the subject. And again, let's avoid thinking of it as a law or rule or something that we have to defend or prove. Let's listen instead to how rich and full of meaning this act is. Let's try to understand the imagery and beauty behind it. N.T. Wright speaks of baptism as one of those places, thin places between heaven and earth, a place where God is somehow especially present. And once we understand that, we'll understand why it plays such an important role in God's mission to the world. And the first thing that I want us to notice about baptism is that it is an act of submission. Search the scriptures. Try to find anybody who baptizes themselves. The word is almost always used in the passive where someone is baptized by somebody else. Now, we recently had a baptism at our church in Johnson City, Tennessee, in which an older woman who had been a believer for many, many years had avoided baptism because she was utterly terrified of water. 
not terrified of taking a drink or having a shower, but frightened of going under the surface and not being able to breathe. It was an irrational phobia, but the mere thought of it put her in a state of panic. But she finally decided it was something she needed and really wanted to do. But she was worried about how she might respond in the moment, so she didn't want to be baptized in front of an entire congregation, but chose to have a small private ceremony with her family and a few friends from the church. Now, just think about what this woman went through here. More than almost any of us, she recognized how much trust she was putting in the hands of her son who was baptizing her. In her mind, her very life was in his hands. She depended on him to pull her out of the watery death trap as quickly as possible. She herself would be powerless. She would be frightened beyond all belief. She was totally dependent on his mercy and strength to save her. When a person is baptized by another person, it is an act of trust and submission. The person doing the baptism is a representative and emissary of the kingdom of God acting on God's behalf. And when you place yourself in their hands, you are acknowledging your own helplessness and dependence. In Genesis, we see how humanity, along with everything else, was created in a dependent relationship with God. We were designed, originally designed, to be dependent on the source of life in order to live an abundant life. But we also see how humanity rebelled against having to rely on God, thinking we could be sufficient in and of ourselves. Baptism demonstrates that we now realize the folly of that rebellion. In it, we submit to God and acknowledge that true life can only be found through our connection with him. Which naturally, I think, leads us to the second point that Paul makes in Romans 6. Baptism is a picture of death and burial. More than once, Jesus stressed the impossibility of following him without first dying to self, without putting aside all those old, futile attempts at finding meaning and relevance through our own strivings and goals. Pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps may sound like a great American philosophy, but it's both physically and spiritually impossible. Before you can make Jesus Lord and Master, you need to kill off the old Lord yourself. Everyone goes through, everyone who goes through a 12-step recovery program realizes the importance of this. The first three steps in addiction recovery are, number one, realize your own helplessness to fix yourself. Number two, believe there is a power greater than you capable of making that change. And three, decide to turn your life and will over to that greater power. Those three steps are there in vivid color when someone goes down into the water and comes back out. It is a way of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Baptism as a picture of death and burial is a way of repeating the words of Jesus in the garden when he said to his father, not my will, but yours. But Paul doesn't stop there in Romans 6 because baptism involves both going down into the grave and coming back up again. There's more to this story. There's resurrection. There's new life. There's new purpose and strength available when we have put aside the old self and welcomed the new, when you've deposed the old ruler and installed the new. It is, in many ways, like being reborn. Didn't Jesus say something like that to Nicodemus? Or, as Paul put it, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. Now, that's how it actually goes in the Greek. More like an exclamation than an explanation. Everything's new. You've been transformed, renewed, recreated. It's amazing. It's exciting. Remember that. It's a marker in life to cling to when you start longing to put yourself in charge again. And by the way, and I don't know that the writers of the New Testament had this so much in mind, but did you know that one of the more common uses of the root bapto at that time of the New Testament was in the process of dyeing fabrics. Artisans would mix colored elements from different plants or minerals with water and immerse fabrics in them to turn them into different colors. They would baptize the fabrics. Now think what a beautiful image that is of Christian baptism. 
The fabrics go into the colored water looking dull and drab and come out as something exciting and useful. It's the same cloth, but made new, made beautiful. I think that'll preach, don't you? No, no extra charge for the sermon illustration. <laughs> but you see, don't you, that this dying to self and rising to Christ is also a picture of repentance. Now, we know that John's baptism was one of repentance and that Christian baptism is more than that, but we need to remember that Christian baptism includes that and adds to it. And remember, repentance is an about face. It's walking down a path, stopping, and going a different direction. A friend of mine who published, uh, has published dozens of books tells me that a key element to any good story is what he calls the pivot, the point in the story where something happens that changes the direction of the storyline, that creates a new unexpected possibility of resolving the struggle. Baptism is pictured as that pivot in our own narratives. No longer do we live in the old ways with the old goals and values and attempts at building ourselves up. No, having directed our lives toward God, we now take on his values and goals. When we are baptized, we are committing to God's mission of restoring all of creation to him, and we can be a part of this mission because we have been and are being restored ourselves. So, where have we gotten so far? Baptism is an act of submission and dependence. It's an act of dying to self and to the old way of life. It's an act of repentance, of turning around the direction of your life. It's an act of resurrection and new life with new goals and purposes. But those are only some of the dimensions of baptism that we find in the New Testament. For instance, and there's a little easily passed over phrase in Acts 2.39. Now, most people are well acquainted with Acts 2.38, where Peter, on the day of Pentecost, tells the crowd to repent and be baptized. But we stop paying attention by the end of that verse. But in the very next verse, he says that the promise is for everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. There's a famous book that we missions professors use by Vincent Donovan called Christianity Rediscovered about a Catholic priest in Tanzania who decided to ditch all the old ways of doing mission with all the additions that have accrued over through church history and take the simple gospel message of Jesus to the Maasai people and let them decide for themselves. And it was one of those Maasai elders who came to him and said, you told us of the high God, how we must search for him, even leave our land and our people to find him. But we have not done this. We have not searched for him. He has searched for us. All the time, we think we are the lion. In the end, the lion is God. God is the hunter, the lion, the one who's looking for us. We Americans, with our views of self-determination and independence, sometimes think this is all about us. We're the ones who believe. We're the ones making the changes. We're the ones doing it all. And we don't see that God is is the one who beckons, who seeks us out, who is always calling and welcoming. In Acts 2.39, we see baptism as a response to that call. It's our response to the Lord of the universe who, for some reason, after millennia of foolish and even hostile human behavior, still pursues us. In baptism, we let the lion catch us. And in allowing ourselves to be caught, and opening ourselves to what our pursuer has in store for us, instead of being torn to pieces, we find we receive forgiveness. God has not been seeking after us to destroy us, but to restore us to that relationship he intended for us all along. And if we keep reading one verse further to Acts 2.40, we see yet one more dimension of, of baptism. We find that it is an act of resistance. It's a form of rebellion. Peter says to the people, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Yes, in baptism, we are allowing ourselves to be caught by God. We experience his forgiveness. We're dying to self and giving our lives a new direction, but we do not exist as isolated creatures in this world. We're part of a society, of a shared culture. And while every culture certainly contains those elements that point to heaven, that coalesce with the life God would have us live. It's also true that every culture has elements of systemic sin. 
When we were in Papua New Guinea, I came to realize that overwhelming structural sin of that culture was jealousy. If someone from the village came to me for food and I gave him a bag of rice, everyone else would be angry at him and me because I treated him differently from the rest. Anytime one person seemed to get ahead or make improvements in his or her life, the rest of the people would become jealous and angry and do what they could to put that person back in their place. But then coming back to America, I saw we have our own problems here. This is a greedy and selfish society. The goal of secular life in the West seems to be to acquire more and more, whether it be money, things, power, or security. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. Every culture is tainted by sin. And so in addition to being a response that says to God, I choose to redirect my life to you, baptism is a picture of reframing my alliances, of recognizing that we are no longer a true citizen of our old culture. We're, we've joined a new culture. And what seems so important to us as a part of that old culture no longer applies. We're called out of that culture to become a part of something new. Now, of course, this transfer of loyalties doesn't happen instantly once we come out of the water. In fact, none of what we're talking about is a totally done deal once we've been baptized. But the direction of this new journey is established. We now have an idea, not only of where we're headed, but of what we're leaving behind. Which leads me to another closely related dimension. Just like that child that is born, we see in the New Testament that there's a new social dimension that opens to a person at baptism. It's not just about what goes on inside you. Paul says that we're all baptized into one body. We're now a part of a new family. There are others around us who can support and guide us, others that can give us a sense of belonging, others who will love us as Christ loved the church. Yes, we've come out of that evil generation, and some have been baptized at the cost of their very families, but Jesus promised that he would give those who have left behind homes and families that God would provide them with much, much more. We don't emerge from the baptismal waters to go through this life as lone rangers. We are now a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. We're not just baptized in Christ. We're baptized into the church of Christ. Now, I'm running out of time, so I better pick things up a bit. So I'm going to combine a few things here by pointing out that in the Great Commission, we're to baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When we speak of doing something in someone's name, it means it's with their purposes and authority in mind. They are baptized as an indication of a new set of allegiances. Now, I've already spoken a bit about how this relates to both God the Father and Jesus the Son in his death and resurrection, but like a good Campbellite, I haven't yet mentioned the Spirit. But there it is in the Great Commission. We find the Spirit in Acts 2.38. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist spoke about one who would come after him and would baptize people in the Holy Spirit. Throughout Acts, we repeatedly see baptism connected to the reception of God's Spirit. You really cannot talk about biblical dimensions of baptism without mentioning God's Spirit. And here's why this is so important. We've already come to understand that baptism is connected to new beginnings, a new life with new loyalties, a new power to live as citizens of God's kingdom. But we've also seen that it's an act of submission of letting God's will and strength overcome our own so that we can begin this Christward journey in life. And all of this is only possible because God has sent us his spirit to help mold and develop our wills and personalities. Yes, in the New Testament, we sometimes see spectacular things happen as people receive God's Spirit. But the more important story has to do with that long process of sanctification, of allowing God to shape us, that starts at baptism and continues on through the rest of our lives. There are so many more dimensions of baptism that we find in Scripture. Paul speaks of baptism as a means of being clothed with Christ. Peter speaks of it as an appeal for a clean conscience. 
Throughout the New Testament, it's an enactment and confession of faith. It is a sign of being totally engulfed, absorbed into this new reality. It's all of that and more. And if you're paying attention, you'll see that all of these dimensions of baptism are also dimensions of discipleship. When Jesus commissions his followers to go and make disciples, baptism had to be the first step. As Christ's ambassadors, we join him in seeking others, of inviting them into this new reality, a new way of living and thinking to become a part of a new family and culture, a way of overcoming everything that is holding them back from abundant life. Do you see why it has always been a part of the mission of the church? Do you see why such a simple act speaks louder than a million sermons? Yes, it is a symbol. Yes, we can view it as a command to be obeyed, but God gave this gift to us for so much more than that. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about the other means of making disciples. But for now, let's close in prayer. God, you have pursued us and found us, and now you have sent us to the rest of the world to invite others to be a part of your new creation. We thank you for the beauty and gift of baptism, and we rejoice that through it, you empower us to have a share in your great restoration project. Amen. <laughs>